live from New York. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube. Covering Rapid Miner Wisdom 2016. Brought to you by Rapid Miner. Now, your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to Rapid Miner Wisdom. We're here in downtown New York City, the Big Apple. Vamsi Kemetaganti is here. He's the general manager of financial services at Horton Works, uh, a company we know well. Vamsi, welcome to theCUBE. It's good to see you. Great, thanks Dave and Jeff, and glad to be here. So Horton Works has been riding the big data wave since the, the early days. Everybody knows the story, spun out of Yahoo. Uh, we've had you know, guys like Rob Bearden and Sean Conley on many times and many other practitioners within the Horton Works community. So, but give us the update, it's specifically to financial services. We're here in the heart of the, the financial services world. It's your wheelhouse. Yeah, absolutely. On? So uh, it's an interesting uh, industry to be in, Dave, uh, just the Hadoop and the big data movement. But just to add to that, with banking being at the forefront of a lot of the predictive analytics, the, the real-time decisions, as well as the historical, uh, uh, the historical space with risk data aggregation, anti-money laundering, really exciting times. So uh, Hortonworks, as you know, is the, uh, uh, the leading open source, pure open source provider for Hadoop solutions uh, in the Gartner Magic Quadrant and all those good places. Uh, but banking really forms our number one or number two vertical. So we don't just work with banks in a classical vendor uh, setting, but we're perceived to be partners. So they're helping us improve the Hadoop platform uh, and the ecosystem uh, and driving it to be a true uh, application level ecosystem in addition to having strong data management, aggregation, governance capabilities. And that's where I think the story gets really interesting with predictive analytics. So is that really kind of what's happened? In the early days of, of Hadoop, the, the, the banks were basically building out data pipelines and sort of eliminating sampling. You used to hear that all the time. Right. Um, and, and so is now the emphasis on hardening that, that, that capability, that solution? Or, or as well, are we seeing new use cases for That's platform? a great question. And the way I like to answer that is, uh, if I take an analogy to Web 1.0, where you had the, the portals on the internet about 10, 15 years ago, uh, and then now you have Web 2.0 with really interactive services being offered over mobile channels, over you know, your Androids, your uh, iOSs, et cetera. Uh, big data, uh, you, know, you would call it big data 1.0 where banks did exactly what you described uh, uh, a couple years ago in terms of being able to understand big data, understand how Hadoop was different and how disruptive Hadoop could be to the data ecosystem. But banks spent a lot of time uh, ingesting the data, landing it in Hadoop, and transforming the data, and basically using Hadoop to supplant existing data warehouse architectures or relational databases. Now I think we're at the cusp of big data 2.0, where the simple problems or a lot of the plumbing challenges have been solved. But banks now want to use big data in what I like to call the defensive dimensions, where they're being able to understand the risk that is being run across all the different products they offer from a market risk perspective, now with all the tumult in the markets, also from a liquidity risk perspective uh, in terms of the web of connected financial institutions, uh, and also from offensive, which is to use the data and the real-time interactions to drive more of a, a responsive experience to uh, consumers, much like what you get with an Amazon or a Yahoo or a Google.com, and really to use that to transform their business uh, as what's known as digital transformation, essentially. How much effort is, is being placed on making the predictive models better, and how are organizations doing that? Is it more data? Is it, is it tuning the, the model, injecting machine learning? Sure. Talk about that a little bit. Great question. So, uh, I think to be realistic about uh, the power of predictive analytics, right? We're probably at 20 or 30% of the journey to Nirvana, which would be uh, essentially being able to plug in predictive models, models that do clustering, segmentation, classification, and also maybe deep learning, but do all of that at scale. Uh, the challenge is being that, uh, and I see uh, quite a bit of that even now, is that uh, typically a large portion of the project is spent in what I like to call data janitorial work by the data scientists. <laughs> you know, bring in the data, munch the data, transform the data, do I have all the data I need, or you know, uh, are, am I overfitting my models, whatever have you. And then I would say 30 or the 40 percent of the work is productive work spent in, uh, you know, really uh, creating models and deploying them to do credit card fraud detection, uh, you know, anti-money laundering, or whatever have you. Projects that result in real business value. Uh, but I think uh, kudos to a lot of the work done by, uh, you know, 
uh, Rapid Miner and some of the other leaders in the Gartner uh, Analytics Quadrant, you'll see that that percentage of that work is, to, is the, the janitorial work is going to start decreasing. Uh, and more of the time will be spent in being productive and being able to help the data scientist leverage his or her domain expertise to create actual business uh, outcomes. And Hortonworks has been uh, a part of this. We're not just a Hadoop company. Uh, we also uh, purchased a technology uh, known as uh, Apache NiFi uh, in the community. Uh, we call it Hortonworks Dataflow because we recognize that a big bottleneck in realizing value is being able to ingest data at scale uh, using you know, file-based ingest, databases, uh, message queues, whatever have you, and being able to help the data science process from an overall onboarding the data, cleansing the data perspective. Yeah, so what you described before is people spend all the time cleansing the data, that's yeah. what everybody complains about, but you're saying increasingly we're now able to shape the algorithms to the data as opposed to spending all the time on the data. Is that a correct interpretation? Exactly, so uh, with, with the fact that you have tools like Rapid Miner, which give you, which open up the data science field to not just the, the core techies in an organization. We're, take, we're getting to the point where data science is not a dark art anymore, but it's more accessible to data analysts and to software developers uh, who can use some of the models that have been created by a team of data scientists and collaborate in a true team environment. Given that there's so much customization involved, at least in the early days of, of analytics solutions, particularly in the financial services world, there has to be a lot of paranoia about IP. Um, <laughs> how is the industry dealing with that? Are they trying to minimize outside services? Uh, are they sort of, is it contractual that protects right. them? You know, which, which kind of might, kind of might not? No, how are they dealing with that? A great question, Dave. So we see a couple of different things out there. In banking specifically, there are things every bank must do to stay, uh, to stay compliant with the regulation. And you, know, you could go to any of the big five research and you should look at the fact that 60% uh, you know, of all IT dollars are going to risk data aggregation. W what we're trying to push the industry to, and the industry largely recognized that, and you, I think you'll see this more of this with blockchain technology as it, as it uh, you know, gets into prime time, is that banking customers should consider building utilities where they can onboard a lot of the common plumbing type tasks and not have them replicated from bank to bank to bank. So in, in areas like KYC, Know Your Customer, we've already seen a couple of utilities being built, and I was part of one uh, while working at Red Hat. Uh, but what we're trying to push with industry is obviously a couple of things, right? Uh, where possible, the industry partners with players like Hortonworks or Rapid Miner to create these baseline models, but design these baseline models in such a way that the banks can create their own IP on top of that. And now whether they wish to contribute it to the open source community or not is a question left to them. But I think with Google and Yahoo uh, open sourcing, Google open sourcing their neural net deep learning framework, and Yahoo uh, you know, releasing a lot of public data sets to the public uh, to you know, help improve models, I think you're not too far off from banking realizing that, uh, hey, what, what, what could be for the benefit of everybody, we should probably release it out there and be seen as thought leaders. And what's IP or really core to our business secret sauce, we keep in house. Well, it's interesting, you, it's a lot of things you mentioned <laughs> in there, blockchain, the, you know, Google, uh, yeah. uh, open sourcing, it's yeah. uh, yeah. essentially it's AI. You know, we hear a lot about IBM Watson, and we actually, we actually asked uh, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Paul Gillen, asked Bob Picciano at the MIT conference, will you open source Watson? And he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> and now you see, you know, in, in the data science circles, you, you people say, well, well, Facebook and Google have the killer, you know, AI right. and cognitive, and so it's really going to be interesting to see that. But I wanted to ask you about blockchain. It's like two years ago, three years ago, it was like, Bitcoin, what the hell? And now <laughs> it's like this awakening to the potential application of, right. of blockchain. So, and you're seeing you know, open source projects and, 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 and security initiatives. So there, it's, what's your take on that? I mean, it's likely there won't be one blockchain. <laughs> no, great, great, great question, Dave. So I think blockchain is going to be the number one disruptive technology in many industry verticals. Banking just being uh, one of them. And you know, blockchain really got its start with the Bitcoin technology or the Bitcoin currency. And obviously, uh, the whole financial industry is built around intermediaries, right? Uh, right? So when you work with a credit card, you're either, you know, there's a Visa or a MasterCard taking a few points off every transaction. And you, know, you talk to retailers, a lot of heartburn about the interchange fees or whatever have you. If you look at, uh, uh, even though blockchain uh, and Bitcoin might have their origins in the libertarian way of thinking, 
Uh, there's a lot of, uh, again, keeping that whole side of the argument, it's a different, uh, you know, what kind of economics is right, Keynesian versus, you know, the libertarian Hayek school. Uh, I think what it really enables you is a couple of different things. Blockchain 1.0 got its start, as uh, uh, you know, we like to call it, from the digital currency and freeing the world up from this intermediary problem that you have. But you look at certain markets like Argentina or uh, even the developing countries where 40% you know, of the world's population does not have access to banking services. Just being able to bank using a simple cell phone is a tremendous uh, you know, win. And banks would want to be part of that. But I think with the blockchain 2.0, with smart contracts, being able to write programming into contracts and being able to have a global ledger, the potential for that is going to be disruptive across healthcare, financial services, IOT, retail, et cetera. One last point here is to what you mentioned. Blockchain, we're not talking about one blockchain to conquer them all. There are going to be vertical blockchains that serve a certain industry or constituency of interest. So I could see a KYC data utility move to a private blockchain with a bunch of banks collaborating on a set of access permissions and you know, tighter controls as they want to see it and not have any of the data leave the data center, not be publicly available, uh, even though you're the hot, strongest you know, cryptography backing it up. But you also are going to see uh, uh, interorganizational blockchains as well, or whatever you like to call them, or variants. And then there's always going to be the public blockchain, which I think is a very robust technology that we begin with. So in short, I think it's going to be disruptive to the way we view the world in, in at least a few years. But, but, but if I heard you correctly, you, you don't necessarily see a scenario where the trusted third party disappears, but you're saying that the role of that trusted third party transforms and adds value in different ways. No, absolutely. So uh, this is something I point out in my blog as well. Uh, I don't think enterprise practitioners uh, or you know, bank CTOs or healthcare CIOs should view the blockchain as replacing the existing structure in their industry. But I would see blockchain uh, forming a complementary comp uh, paradigm to start with. I think over a period of time, in certain industries, uh, you're going to see like mortgages as an example. Uh, the ability for a consumer to request a mortgage and have that mortgage be granted using a smart contract and then have that credit checking all go online, I think is going to be disruptive to certain industry segments. So you know, it depends on the segment you're talking about, but it'll start being complementary and over time subsume some of the uh, you know, the, the third party nature that's omnipresent across banking, healthcare, manufacturing, whatever have you. Right, so um, let's bring it back to sort of big, big data, yep. Hadoop. Uh, we talked, given a couple of good 1.0, 2.0 analogies. Everybody talking about, you know, real time, you know, right. sparks all the buzz. Um, what's happening in the Hadoop ecosystem? It's, it's, it's increasingly complex um, and, and burgeoning, which I guess is good, right. sign of growth. Um, you know, the, the markets are a little shaky these days, you know, when's the funding drying up? A lot of people are asking that question. What's your take on Hadoop, the evolution of Hadoop, the impact of things like Spark, you guys embracing it, sort of coming up with your own versions? Talk about that a little bit. So a couple of things, right, from, let me first address a business perspective. Uh, obviously, uh, Hortonworks, probably the, uh, the largest public uh, Hadoop player. Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth in our business, right? There's 890 plus customers signed in. We're signing new logos every quarter. Mm -hmm. A lot of banks, a lot of healthcare organizations, a lot of IoT type shops are moving from uh, having the technology leave the lab to having it pr produce actionable business insights. So where we are now compared to two years ago, if Hadoop was this small and you had the, the whole other big, uh, you know, the box which was the the EDWs, the RDBMSs, now we're starting to see Hadoop becoming bigger and bigger as time goes back. So you have that whole motion on the data side itself, where Hadoop's becoming a bigger chunk of the operation, and we see that being a, a trend that's going to continue exponentially. On the technology side, a lot of work is being done, a lot of fantastic work is being done by uh, Hortonworks and even our competitors. And uh, if you look at the Yarn Project, as it's known, Arun Murthy is a Hortonworks founder, and he conceived of the Yarn project. And what Yarn does is it forms a spine on top of the Hadoop distributed file system and explodes the use cases that you could put on Hadoop. So Hadoop moves from being a, mm. a data technology to being an application technology. So you mentioned real time. In Hadoop 1.0, the focus is on batch oriented processing. With 2.0, with, with the Hortonworks 2.x releases, now you can get batch, you can get real time, you can get streaming, you get time series and your, your ability to extend Hadoop is only limited by imagination. So we see a lot of clients not just putting in, to talk about financial services, a batch-oriented risk application, 
where a lot of book of record transaction data, wire data, core banking data, uh, payment data shows up, uh, and you calculate a bunch of uh, you know, analytics that provide risk exposure center day, we're actually seeing real-time transactions being streamed in to, hey, if a wire transfer happened of you know, money from one entity to another, could this indicate money laundering? So the New York Times had an article last week about shell companies buying up real estate in Manhattan. That's a classic money laundering pattern you're talking about. Using Hadoop, Hortonworks Hadoop, and rapid minor predictive analytics, you can intercept that in real time, and you can marry that with historical data to detect what your confidence level is in this transaction being fraudulent or not. So I think that opens up Hadoop to you know, a whole bunch of use cases, and we'll see more growth of that. And in that's the a years good example of, you know, we, we, and one, of our, one of our research themes is building out systems of intelligence and essentially bringing transaction and analytic systems together and affecting business outcomes in near real time. And, and we're starting to see that you know, come to reality. So we have to leave it there, but th thanks very much, Mamsi, for coming on theCUBE. It was great to see you again. Great, thanks Dave, and thanks right. Jeff. Keep right there, everybody, we'll be back. From New York City, Rapid Minor Wisdom 16, right back.